we're going to start right now and one first thank the Mead Public Library for having us today and obviously thank you for your interest in the town hall meeting we're having today. My name is Billy Feilinger and I'm the executive director of the Wisconsin Alliance for Tired Americans and myself and Doug will be introducing ourselves in a minute but I first would like to introduce Patty Haferman who's the county's elder benefit specialist and when we have these town hall meetings around the state uh, we always like to invite the elder benefit specialists and let them talk for a minute or two to introduce themselves if you don't know her. Uh, Doug and I always call the um, elder benefit specialists the angels of our state. We're really very fortunate to have at least one uh, elder benefit specialist in every county in the state of Wisconsin. So at this point, Patty, do you want to make some very brief comments and then hopefully that will Yes, good. yes. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I am the elderly benefit specialist. So if you are somebody who is turning 60, uh, thinking about retiring, I would be the person you would call. Um, I see some familiar faces in here. It's kind of nice <laughs> to see. I work with Medicare. I work with Social Security, um, all four parts of Medicare. People say that to me all the time. Do you work with all four parts, Pat? And I go, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Sad, but I do. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're located, uh, the, the plastic uh, holder that you got is from the agency where I am located. I'm located in the ADRC here in Sheboygan uh, County, out actually in Sheboygan Falls. ADRC stands for Aging and Disability Resource Center. Um, and like I said, we're, we're kind of a one-stop shop out there. Um, you can come out and see me if you have people that you know that are disabled from the age of 18 up to 59 and a half. There's a disability bend spec that works in this county now to help people get disability. So there's a lot out there. There's a lot out there in, at the ADRC. And you're always welcome just to stop by and see us. If you want to see me, uh, the people in here that know me would say, call her and make an appointment. You all have my card in there. That's my direct number to my office, okay? Um, I tend to be in and out a lot sometimes, but um, you'll always get a call back. Don't worry about that. Okay? Great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Um, and if anybody has any questions, Patty will be here till around, what time, Patty? 10.30. 10.30, okay. So maybe afterwards, but you already gave a card and everybody's, did everyone get a cop, get a, that packet? Great. Um, and thanks again for coming, Patty. Um, as I said before, my name is Billy Feilinger, and I'm the executive director of the Wisconsin Alliance for Retired Americans. And Ron Miller is back there from Community Access from your area. Uh, myself and Doug and Nate uh, from Know Your Care have been going around the state of Wisconsin and all different parts of the state holding these kinds of town hall meetings. Our organization is a nonprofit organization. We provide public education and advocacy with people like yourselves and others around the state on state and federal programs that affect you, current or future retirees. Um, and we do this on a regular basis, Medicare, Social Security. One other quick thing from what Patty just said, if you are on Medicare right now, because she said 60 and over, if you're on Medicare right now, there is a window of an opportunity every year. If you're not interested in your current insurance plan, you can change it during that window. I think in 2011, I think it was like from October 15th or 16th or November 15th to the middle of December. So October, October it was October 15th, okay. And so th this next year, if you have a plan and you're interested in thinking about changing it, Patty's the best person to talk to. At this point, I'm going to introduce Doug Hill from Know Your Care, and then I will make some comments, and then we'll open to questions and concerns that you might have. Doug Hill. Thanks, Billy. I really appreciate it. I'm going to stand up. I have a raspy voice, so sometimes people have a hard time hearing me, but thank you for uh, having us here today. Uh, we're happy to be here. Nate and I drove over from Wausau this morning, so it was a little bit foggy, but that means spring is on the way, so we're, we feel good about that. As Billy said, my name is Doug Hill. Uh, I am the state director of an organization called Know Your Care Wisconsin, and Know Your Care Wisconsin is also a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and our organizational mission or task is to go around the state of Wisconsin to help educate and answer questions about the Affordable Care Act. 
the health care reform law that was passed almost two years ago now. Uh, March 23rd will mark the two-year anniversary of the health care reform law uh, becoming law and being signed by President Obama. And if you're unfamiliar with the health care reform law or the uh, Affordable Care Act, it's more often referred to in the media as Obamacare. So when you talk about Obamacare, it's kind of interchangeable with the health care uh, reform law. Um, one of the things I like to say right off the bat when we talk about, um, you know, the benefits of the Affordable Care Act and the Affordable Care Act I itself is I understand and I acknowledge um, right away that when the health care law was passed, that it was controversial, that many people were for it, many people were against it, there were people supporting it and people not supporting it. But our organization really doesn't um, take a position of being for or against it. Obviously, I'm here to talk about it, so I want to talk about the positive aspects of the law. But our organization really believes that it's important that people understand uh, the Affordable Care Act law, the benefits that are available to them, just as we would any other law. I think very oftentimes, uh, as public policy is passed, whether it be at the city level, the state level, or the national level, very oftentimes people don't fully understand every single aspect of it. Um, and it's important that, that we do as citizens because it does affect us. And so that's really the core mission of our organization is to try and go out around the state with organizations like Billy and other organizations to talk about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, even if you um, were supportive or not supportive of the Affordable Care Act, um, there are benefits of the law right now that are affecting you and um, members of your family and members of your community. And I'll, before I talk about the specific ones that affect um, seniors and people in Medicare, I'm just going to talk about a few aspects of the law uh, that are currently in place um, affecting everybody. Two years ago, when the law was signed uh, on March 23rd, two years ago, um, a number of the provisions of the law came into effect right away. And one of the core ones was the elimination of pre-existing conditions for children. So previous to the law being signed, if your child um, uh, had a pre-existing condition, they could, by law, be removed from your health insurance. Uh, and so when the law was signed, that's one of the first measures that uh, took effect, that no longer could children be kicked off of your health insurance because of a pre-existing condition. That part of the law will affect all Americans starting January 1, 2014. Okay. Another provision of the law uh, affected young adults age 26 and under. So um, starting January 1 of this past year, um, if you were a young adult age 26 or under, you can now stay under your parents' health insurance. Previous to that, um, young adults didn't have um, access to the possibility of staying under their parents' health insurance. And as young adults graduate from college, they move into the work world or go on to two-year uh, college or four-year college, having access to health care is one of those things that they didn't have in the past and that they now have access to. Over 23 million young adults uh, since the law came into effect, now have health insurance under their parents' plan. So that's another aspect. Um, one more is starting August 1st of this year, preventive services for all women will be covered, including mammography, cervical cancer screening, uh, some assistance with things like um, nutrition and, um, and um, breastfeeding, um, issues with domestic violence and things like that. Um, a lot of those uh, um, uh, measures will now be covered under the Affordable Care Act. So women can go in for some of those preventive services um, that you know, tend to um, be uh, a cost a little bit more and they might not have access to. So those are some of the things that um, are in place right now. And when the law is fully in, in uh, effect in uh, January 1 of 2014, a lot of these measures will be uh, fully in effect. But what we want to talk about um, mainly here today is the preventive services um, to senior citizens uh, uh, and elder Americans uh, who are on Medicare uh, because of the Affordable Care Act. Um, when we talk about preventive services, one of the things that I think is most important to point out is that 75% of all uh, the money that is spent on health insurance in this country goes to treat chronic disease. Things like diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, 75% of all the money uh, expended in this country goes to treat chronic disease. And one of the main aspects of the Affordable Care Act, whether it's for children, for women, for young adults, and for elder Americans, is to try and get after those preventive uh, measures and preventive care so that we can um, hopefully by getting uh, a handle on 
health care and disease and, and illness at the early part of onset, we can try and keep those costs down and, and save money. So you'll see uh, as you look at various aspects of the Affordable Care Act that prevention is really a, a key part. And you might say, well, why is, you know, you know, why prevention for senior citizens or prevention for, for young adults or for women? Just to give you one more statistic, in Sheboygan, Sheboygan County, there are 19,296 um, people on Medicare. That's 17% of the population, and it's about one in every six people. So you can see that, you know, it, it does have a pretty big effect um, on a number of people here in Sheboygan County. So uh, talking really quickly about uh, the Affordable Care Act measures for uh, preventive care for um, Medicare for the next couple minutes. Um, Billy and I like to use this really great ha handbook. It's the Your Guide to Medicare Preventive Services. It's a publication by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, and it's a great booklet because it's user friendly. Does everybody have one? If, okay, hey, hey Nate. Could you bring up a couple more? Hold up your hand if you don't have one and Nate will bring you a booklet. Um, these, are, these are really great just because they're, they're really user friendly. And um, now under the Affordable Care Act law, there are a number of preventive benefits that are available to people on, on Medicare. And this booklet is a great guide to help us walk through some of those preventive benefits. And that's what I'll talk about now. So if, when you get your book, if for those of you that don't have them, Nate's coming up right now. Um, if you open up to the table of contents, which is on page three, I'll just really briefly go through this. Under the introduction, uh, the first section is what you can do to help prevent a illness. Just kind of talks about some good tips to, that you should know um, uh, in helping with preventive care. Uh, the second part under section one is how to talk to your doctor or health care provider. Just some tips that you should know when you're talking about um, preventive care. And then some basic things you should know uh, when you're reading about this booklet. Under section two, uh, talking about preventive care. Now, um, because of the Affordable Care Act, um, you, once you become Medicare eligible, so for me it'll be tw about 22 years, I'll be Medicare eligible. <laughs> He's a youngster. <laughs> I, uh, it's funny though, I'll tell you, when my wife and I go on walks now, instead of talking about kids and things like that, we're starting to talk about retirement and things like that, so it's, it's pretty funny. <laughs> I do have a way to, but it's never too, never too early to plan. So now, for me in 22 years, um, once I become Medicare eligible, I'm entitled to what's called a Welcome to Medicare Prevention Visit. And what that is, it's a really brief introductory visit for me to sit down with my health care provider so that I can start the dialogue with them about my health care and some things that um, my doctor may want me to know. What and so I'm, I'm still on page three, and I'm talking about preventive services. Welcome to uh, Medicare Preventive Visit. Um, and so what this is, is it's not a full-blown physical where they're going to do diagnostic tests or things like that. It's really meant to start the dialogue with your physician. So I'll, we'll go in and I'll sit down. They might do a, a blood pressure. They might do a pulse and ask some medical history. Maybe I'll, I'm on some prescription drugs at that time. And I'll say, here's what I'm, you know, the prescription drugs I'm on. Um, and it's an opportunity for me to, you know, share my concerns and for the doctor to share their concerns with me as to some things that, you know, I might want to be concerned about. So then after that one-time welcome visit, each year, every year, you're entitled to a, um, an, an annual wellness visit, okay? And this would be for free and at no cost, okay? Um, and at this, this one-time visit is very similar, wellness visit is very similar to the welcome to uh, a Medicare visit where, again, you're doing a brief um, health history, um, you know, the blood pressure, the pulse, things like that. It's kind of a, re a review of the year saying, hey, here's, here's where my health is right now. Here's some things that happened to me this year. Here are things I'm concerned about. And it's an opportunity for you to talk to your doctor again about things that you're concerned about. And it's an opportunity for him or her to share with them some things that they think that you should be thinking about. And so again, it's not a full-blown diagnostic, you know, visit with tests. But again, it's, it's trying to get that dialogue going. Um, one of the best questions we get um, when we're doing these preventive um, forms is, or as I go through these uh, preventive benefits, is, well, hey, Doug, I'm already on Medicare. Are, don't I already get these benefits and these treatments um, right now? And my answer is, yes, you do. What's different, though, because of the Affordable Care Act is a lot of these services now are for free or at a reduced cost and a reduced copay. So that's the big thing, and we'll talk about some of those as we go through these. So some of the other preventive services that are covered now because of the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, cardiovascular screening, breast cancer screening, including mammography, 
cervical cancer screening, um, colorectal cancer screening for men, prostate uh, cancer screening, a number of immunizations, including flu shots. So now you should be able to go in and get a flu shot for free. You shouldn't be paying for it um, at least once a year. Um, bone mass measurement, diabetes screening with supplies and management training, nutritional therapy, glycoma testing, and a number of other preventive um, services uh, all meant to help us get a handle on, um, on, our, uh, on our health. Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn to page 15 really quickly. I'm just going to uh, highlight um, that section. Quick, quick question. Yeah. You, all, you have to have Part B, though, right? Nope. So nope. We're no, this is. Well, sure, some of them you, you might have to, there might be a Part B deductible for it. But if you are on, um, if you're on, on Medicare, you have access to all these preventive services. And I might add at this point in time as well that um, the Affordable Care Act does not affect anybody on Medicare. Uh, I know there's been a lot of, um, I, I'll just call them rumors or misinformation, saying the Affordable Care Act, you know, makes people, you know, move off of the insurance that they already have. That, that's totally not true. If you're on Medicare, you stay on Medicare. If you're on the VA healthcare system, you stay on the VA healthcare system. If you're on a private insurance plan that you still carry from um, your previous employer, you stay on that. The Affordable Care Act does nothing to move you off of that. You still get to stay on, on that if you, if you want to. Okay. Okay, so page 15 is a, it talks about colorectal cancer screening. And why I like using this one is that because it provides a number of different examples. So in each section, on each page, it'll highlight a different preventive service. And so in this one, it highlights colorectal cancer screening. And so at the very top, it just talks about some basic facts about colorectal cancer, usually found in people 50 or older, talks about different screenings for polyps and things like that. And then it jumps right into who is covered. So in this instance, all people, Medicare age 50, and older, but there's no minimum age uh, to have a, a, a screening colonoscopy, okay? And one of the questions we get is, well, how can someone age 50 or under, you know, be on Medicare? Sometimes in a disability situation, um, people who become disabled are entitled to be under Medicare. When you pay um, the FICA tax that you pay, like I pay FICA, you all paid FICA as we did through our jobs, um, part of that, um, that, that tax that we pay is if in extreme circumstances we become um, disabled, sometimes you are uh, able to be on Medicare earlier um, than you normally would be. Not at the same coverage rate, but sometimes you're, you're able to. So that's why it says under age 50. Um, then how often are these colorectal screening cancers covered? So each one of these tests um, is, is covered, and each one is uh, covered at a different rate. So for instance, like the fe fecal occult blood test, you can, you're entitled to that every uh, 12 months. And then the colonoscopy is every 120 months. But if you're at high risk, you can get it sooner. I think here it says every 24 months. And then it jumps into if you have original cost or original Medicare. So for this instance, you pay nothing for the fecal occult blood test. You pay nothing for the, uh, the screening for the colonoscopy if your doctor accepts the Medicare assignment. And then, for instance, it kind of gives some specifics for, like, the barium enemas. You pay 20% of the Medicare-approved amount for the doctor's services. And then in this instance, the Part B deductible doesn't apply. But if it's done in a hospital on, on an outpatient setting, then you'll, you'll pay um, the copay that would normally be covered under the Medicare Part B. Yep. You had a colonoscopy before you were 65. Do they just say you can have one every 10 years starting at 65? Say that one more time. Let's say you had a, a colonoscopy sometime in the past. You don't even yep. remember when. Okay. But when you're 65, is that when you can start having one every 10 years? Um, yeah, when, you, when you're every, well, at once, you're entitled here once every, yep, the 120, correct, every so, 10 years. So Medicare doesn't know what went on in the past, but it would be starting at the 65. Exactly, that would be starting there. And it's the same thing. Someone asked me, is it on a calendar year or is it on when you have it? And it's, it's not on the calendar year, it's when you have it. So if, for instance, I turn 65, I'm Medicare eligible, I go in and say, okay, I want to get that, that preventive screening for the colonoscopy, and I do it in March. Then every, it, would, it would start from that March date. And that's true of any preventive service that you would have. For instance, the flu shot, if you got that, just happened to get it in June, it would be on that June to June. It wouldn't be on the, on the calendar year. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and then at the very end, it just talks about if you're at risk for colorectal cancer and some, some brief tips um, there. So this is, uh, it, it follows pretty similar for the, for the, uh, the other screening uh, uh, and prevention uh, benefits that, that are in here. Um, I'm going to pause at this time, turn it over to Billy for his comments. I'm going to be here for 
uh, questions and answers, and I'd be more than happy to um, help you out um, um, with questions and uh, concerns. And if I don't have the answer, I'll make sure I get your name and number and, and, and get back to you. But I'm going to turn it over to Billy for right now. Great. Thanks, Doug. And then, as Doug said, once I get through, and I'll probably talk me like about 10 minutes, and then open it up to concerns or questions you folks might have. Um, as, I, as I said, my name is Billy Feilinger, and I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Alliance for Retired Americans. And as Doug does his part, I'd like to talk about um, the impact, potential impact, that Congress and pres the President can have on specifically as it relates to Social Security and Medicare. So if you remember, late in the summer of 2011, early in the fall, the Congress um, created this committee called the Super Committee. And the purpose of the Super Committee was to address the federal deficit. What kind of cuts uh, would be necessary to address the deficit, as well as enhancing revenues um, for um, the Congress to take action to reduce that deficit. And as you probably know, or maybe don't know, that they were supposed to make recommendations in December um, to the Congress, and then the Congress was supposed to take a vote on those issues. Well, as it turned out, to make a long story short, they didn't have enough votes at the super committee level to bring anything to the Congress. But I can guarantee you, if you've been following that, all those things that they were talking about are still on the table um, as possible cuts and revenue enhancements. Um, but we feel very strongly that until the entire population of our country uh, participates in sacrifice to deal with the deficit, we will not support any of the things I'm about to tell you. And most of these things that I'm about to tell you probably will not impact you, but could impact your kids and your grandkids. I became a grandfather twice now, and I want to make sure, and I'm sure you do too, want to make sure that our kids and our grandkids have these great programs called Social Security and Medicare. Um, so there really are five reasons why we're in the financial predicament that we're in. And this is not Billy Feilinger from the Wisconsin Alliance telling you this. This is coming from the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan, independent federal department within the federal government who has have reported in back in 2010 there are five basic reasons why we're in this financial predicament. One, we have two wars. One is now going to an end, the Iraqi war. But neither one of those wars were ever paid for until President Obama came on board. Secondly, there's a program called, I'm going to call it Medicare Part D. Um, that's not the exact language, but back in 2003, a law was passed to deal with Medicare beneficiaries having uh, some of their costs through Medicare paying for your prescription drugs. It's a $500 billion program that started in 2006 for 10 years. It wasn't paid for. The third, we had two of the largest tax cuts in the history of America back in 2001 and 2003, where almost over half of it went to the wealthiest 2% of Americans. That wasn't paid for. Four, we currently have double-digit increases to health care costs. Now, that is a problem, and that does impact on Medic the Medicare system, which I'll talk about in a minute. Double-digit increase. And the fifth reason we're in the predicament we're in is that we've had the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression that started back in 2007. Those are the five reasons we're in this predicament. Did anybody hear me say anything about Social Security? Social Security hasn't contributed one penny to the federal deficit, not one penny. In fact, your trust fund, the Social Security trust fund, has a surplus of $2.7 trillion in your trust fund, $2.7 trillion surplus. I know some of you are smiling. I'll tell you why. That Some people say it's, it's just shenanigans, it's um, a Ponzi scheme, it's a bunch of IOU papers. I'll talk about that in a minute. But if the federal government did nothing, and we're not recommending they do that, your trust fund would be able to pay 100% benefits until the year 2037. And remember, we want our kids and our grandkids to have this great program called Social Security. So some things are going to have to change. Back in 1982, then President Reagan, Republican, Speaker of the House, Democrat, Tip O'Neill, came together and were able to come up with a compromise on Social Security. Because of what they were able to do, people like myself, a baby boomer, will now have Social Security 
when I decide to retire, have 100% benefits, because what those men in the Congress did back in 1982, we believe that the adults in the Congress today and the President need to come up with a compromise. It's not going to be an easy one, because we want to make sure that our kids and our grandkids have Social Security. So how does an elected official, a congressman, your congressman, or a U.S. senator here in the state of Wisconsin, tell you that your trust fund is a Ponzi, Social Security is a Ponzi scheme, and it's a bunch of IOUs? There's only one way they could say that to you in all honesty and look you straight in the eye, that they would have to default, default on your Treasury bonds. Both Democrats and Republicans have taken money from your trust fund to use for other federal programs. Our belief is it should be a lockbox. You remember back in 2000, then Vice President Gore ran, running for president said he thought that the Social Security Trust Fund should be a lockbox. Well, it's not happening. So the federal government is using your money. But in response to that, they have to have issued treasury bonds, guaranteed treasury bonds. They're the same treasury bonds that I bought for my grandkids when they first were born in the last few years. They're the exact same guaranteed treasury bonds that we issue to China, that we issue to Japan. So only way that an elected official from our state or our country who can look you straight in the eye and say they're a bunch of pieces of paper, IOUs, don't, that doesn't exist, there's a Ponzi scheme, the only way they can do that is they're going to have to tell you they're going to default on those treasury bonds. And I would like to see the day that anybody in our country or in our state who are elected officials, your congressmen and your U.S. senators, wants to default. They're going to have to vote on that. And I can guarantee you, with you being the largest block of voters, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, you're going to vote those people out of office because they haven't stuck to their commitments that they had made to people like yourselves and future generations with those Treasury bonds. So one thing we think should happen before I talk about Medicare. Right now, workers who contribute of their income is about 100, up to $108,000. So any worker in our country that makes up to $108,000, they contribute 100%. Anybody worker above that, 108 to whatever it might be, does not contribute on, on that part of their income. Now, they don't get, they don't get contributions for Social Security when they retire, but they get it up to $108,000. So for example, Billy Feilinger is a worker today making $50,000 a year. I pay 100% contributions. People like Phil, uh, let's say Bill Gates, just joking around here, makes $300,000. He only pays one third contribution to your trust fund. We believe if we start having them pay either 100%, no matter what their income is, we will have this problem almost solved by the year 2075. Now, we're not going to be living, but again, we want our kids and our grandkids to have this great program. So we believe that's something that should happen right now. It's something similar to what happened in um, 1982. The three things that Congress today are looking at are ch changing their retirement age. Right now, it goes from around 65 upwards to 67, depending on when you were born. But they want to go to almost 70 years old. And I always like to give the example there in um, Appleton, I met with about 25 steelworker retirees. There was one woman who was getting 100% benefits because she lasted as long as she did. But I could tell that she was having problems. She had wristbands and other things around her uh, wrist because she was a steelworker and had a very difficult job. If she had to work till 70 years old, there's no way that woman would have been able to work till 70 years old. If that was the maximum and that was what she had to do, she would have seen significant cuts in her benefits if we increase it over the next 20, 30 years, upwards up to 70 years old. The second is means testing. Now, some people might say means testing is not a big deal, that some people in Congress want to change that certain people would not get Social Security if you made $200,000 a year as a worker. The reason why we're against that is because we believe we want the entire population who works to participate in Social Security. One, we think it's a smart thing politically that all Americans are participating in. And secondly, we don't want this to turn into something that's called a welfare program because people like yourselves have earned this income that you get when you retire. So we don't like means testing. And the third one, which could impact 
you is changing the formula for cost of living. Now, the last couple of years, I think you got a rebate of $250 two years ago. I don't know if you got one last year. This year, it's 3.6% cost of living increase. Well, there's some people in Congress who want to change that formula. That 3.6% by changing the formula would be even less than 3.6. So we're opposed to all those things, but that one could impact on your lives. Now, Medicare, the trust fund, is in financial problems. But thanks to the Affordable Health Care Act, your trust fund will last minimally till the year 2024 and will still be able to make pay benefits after that, but it would be a lot less. So we do need to make some changes, but because of the Affordable Health Care Act, the trust fund is solvent until the year around 2024. The other reason we like we, we support the Affordable Health Care Act are the following reasons. As Doug said, kids right now who have pre-existing conditions can no longer be thrown off of an insurance plan. Kids 26 and under will can still stay on their parents' uh, insurance plan today, 26 and under. That right now, a small insurance company has to, because of the Affordable Health Care Act, has to pay 80% of their premiums to directly pay for medical expenses. Larger insurance companies, premiums have to pay 85% of all the premiums that they get revenue, 85% has to go for medical expenses. And lastly, before I talk specifically about retirees, um, is the fact that we, they have put more money in the Affordable Health Care Act to look at fraud, duplication of billing, uh, waste, things of that sort. Many of health care providers do not mean to do anything fraudulent. They make mistakes. So we want to get a handle on those. And then there is a percentage of health care providers who are doing fraud. And we got to make sure we get every one of those pennies back so that we can use every one of those pennies to help for direct ser medical services. Anybody on Medicare Part D? Anybody here on Medicare Part D? Okay. Back in 2003, that law that I talked about passed called Medicare Part D. And there were two specific, three uh, provisions that I want to mention today real quickly. One is the donut hole. Because of the Affordable Health Care Act, previously, if you met the donut hole, you had to pay 100% of your, out of your pocket to up to $7,600. In 2012, that would have been $2,900 up to $7,600 in 2012, anybody who got into that donut hole before the law passed would have to be 100% out of their pockets. Then after that, 95% by catastrophic would be picked up by Medicare, 5% by the consumer, a Medicare beneficiary. Because of the law, up to $2,900, they pay 75%, the Medicare that you pay 25%. After that, if you're on a brand name prescription drug, you will get a 50% discount if you're in the donut hole from $2,800 to $7,600. If you are on a generic prescription drug, they will pay for, there will be a 14% discount. And in fact, in the, in the county of Sheboygan County, there's about 1,325 um, Medicare beneficiaries in 2011 who fell in the donut hole, sorry about that, who fell in the donut hole um, and they received these discounts. Up, and the, the total was about $850,000 savings for in Sheboygan County, people who met the donut hole, there were about $850,000 savings because of the Affordable Health Care Act. The second thing is uh, uh, Medicare Advantage. Do people know Medicare Advantage? Anybody on Medicare Advantage? Okay, you might not be totally pleased with what I'm about to say. Over, and, and by the way, before I forget, Medicare Part D will end in terms of the donut hole by the year 2020. There will no longer be a donut hole. Obviously, we want it sooner than that, but that's when it will be totally closed. Medicare Advantage, someone just asked me, what is the Medicare Advantage? Medicare Advantage is an alternative program that you can have with, with a private insurance company. Before the law changed, the Affordable Health Care law changed, the, the, the uh, federal government was subsidizing tax dollars, our tax dollars, to give to insurance companies somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 to 15 percent tax subsidies to private insurance companies compared to traditional um, Medicare Part D or Medicare in general. Now, 
they do get more benefits if you're on Medicare Advantage. So I don't want to say they compare apples to apples. But 13 to 15 percent tax subsidies to those insurance companies for this program. And so, I'm sorry about that. I will shut this off. Sorry about that. I don't like seeing, I love seeing my grandkids, but I wish it would just go off now. Oh, well, there it goes. So over the next several years, there will be a reduction in that subsidy. But the program will continue. But at some point, the insurance companies who have Medicare Advantage are going to have to figure out if they want to keep those customers, are they going to keep the level of cost the same or the premiums the same or the co-pays the same or the deductibles? That's something that's has to be worked out. But because of there will be some reduction in those subsidies, over the next 10 years, there will be a savings of about $1.6 billion because of those reductions in the subsidies. So at this point, I think I'd like to open it up to Doug and myself to questions or concerns you have. And again, thanks so much for coming. We have about 15, 20 minutes. Yes, one, and then back to you back there, Carol. Yes. I have two brief questions. Absolutely. My understanding, and I think this is true, I wish um, um, Patty was here, I'm pretty sure that the county's elder benefit spe specialist has that data. Um, I don't know if in Wisconsin, if there's a website that you could go to and um, answer what your, your question, but I'm pretty sure Patty, the elder benefit specialist, should have that information. And if she doesn't, she'll have a better idea where to get that information. You know, I don't know. That's a great question. I wrote it down because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check to see if there's something specific that um, is best to point people to. But I do know that on the back side, on the back cover of this handout, there's a website. It's www.mymedicare.gov. Um, just before I can find an answer for that, I, that's what I would recommend there might be something where people can go and search out. So if you can give Doug website. your name and your phone number, he'll give you a buzz back? Yeah, but I think that's a great question because, you, I mean, rather than hunting and pecking for everything, to go to one spot that will list them would be, would be great. The second question. Oh, yeah. okay, yep. Um, I know that a portion of the Affordable Care Act is going before the Supreme Court very shortly. Mm -hmm. My understanding is just to mandate Correct. that individuals that's right. must it's a very narrow. Else? No, the, the, the question is, is uh, starting uh, in about two weeks, the Supreme Court is going to hear um, a case where essentially the constitutionality of the um, individual mandate portion of the Affordable Care Act is being challenged as unconstitutional. And essentially what that boils down to is the Affordable Care Act um, mandates that every uh, citizen um, in the country, if they don't already have some sort of um, health care, like Medicare, like VA, like private insurance, uh, or a retirement health insurance plan from their previous employer, um, be required to purchase at least a minimal um, coverage of, of health insurance. And the, the premise behind that um, for the law is that uh, it's been proven through actuarial tables and through studies that the best way to lower the cost of health care is to basically put everybody in the pool because when you put everybody in the pool, um, healthy people are also put in the pool, and when you put healthy people in the pool who pay premiums and don't utilize services, that drives costs down for everybody as opposed to just putting the sick people in the pool. Um, so that part of the law is going to be uh, challenged, and um, as, as the lady said, that's just the one, one aspect of it. So we'll, we'll know about that. Um, you know, they're hearing the arguments, and I'm guessing sometime in the Supreme Court, um, we'll probably rule on it in, in the right. same time. And, and that, if it's, um, if it's not overturned, that specific will happen in 2014. Just one quick more thing than Carol. And, and one of the reasons why we support it is because of the following. Billy Feilinger does not have a primary care doctor, does not have um, insurance. My daughter gets hurt. I take her to the emergency room. Well, guess what? 
who pays for that? All of us around this room here and others around the country. And the cost is much more significant by taking my daughter into that nursing, uh, to the emergency um, uh, at hospital than it would be if she had a primary care doctor. And so that's another reason why we we're very supportive, besides the cost effectiveness of including everybody in the population. Carol, and well, then you. because in the last two years, <coughs> they've cut over a billion in um, Medicare payouts, primarily because they set up three, um, three sites in, in Arizona, I'm not sure what city, in Los Angeles and Miami. It, it, the Affordable Air Care Act put together, they uh, enabled a task force of HHS officials and FBI investigators to investigate Medicare fraud. And that's how much they have pulled out of the system because, and it's only the tip of the iceberg, they found that there is a Russian, I, and I believe Albanian criminal gangs that were operating out of post office boxes, storefronts. Hmm. They were paying senior citizens for their Medicare numbers and they were also paying off doctors to submit fraudulent claims. In fact, last two weeks ago on Nightline, they did a uh, session on, I guess, a doctor in Arizona that they were trying to interview. But this is this is an ongoing, continuing thing. And for the lady who was concerned about doctors not accepting consignment, there is one insurance company in Wisconsin that will offer a Medicare supplemental plan that will pay the difference between what Medicare approves and what a doctor charges for non-assigned claims. I know because I have it, and I have one thing that I have to use that the, uh, the pharmacy will not accept assignment on. And I get that paid 100%. In fact, I, other than my insurance premium, I pay nothing for any of my medical claims. Wisconsin also has a unique thing in their tax code that if you um, take the standard deduction, they still allow you to write off cost of your health insurance. Yes. Um, we have a presidential election coming up in a few months. Um, if uh, the party who becomes president doesn't support the Affordable Care Act, and um, if the Senate and the House also no longer support it, can any of what you've talked about, the entire Affordable Care Act, or other Good things, question. could that just be voted out? The answer question, absolutely. So, you know, depending on who gets into office um, in 2000, starting in 2013, everything that we've talked about today, um, if there was a majority in the Congress and the President who support the repeal, they could do that and eliminate everything that Doug and I have talked about today, if that occurs. Yes? Um, I've heard that the cost uh, to Medicare of a, a visit to the emergency room $1,100? I don't know the exact amount, and I would assume it would depend on the service, medical services. But this. generally speaking, it's significantly more, obviously, if you're taking your kid, like my situation, I wouldn't try to do that, but I'm just saying if I would have done that, simply more. I don't know if it's $1,100. It, it's, it's pretty significant, though. It is. I'm not sure I'd use $1,100. I've never heard the exact amount, but I know it's significant. Yes, and then back there. there. There's such a huge gap in the price charged for services. Uh, Party Express plus five thousand dollars. Not Medicare approves seven hundred dollars. It's 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 sad. It's just pathetic, especially to a person who has no insurance. Right. And, yeah. and I think the insurance companies are the ones that are making the big bucks. Yes, back there. Yeah, I just got on Medicare, and I. This wellness visit, visit. Yeah. I yeah. call my doctor and he wants me to have a full physical right away, sure. so I call Medicare today yeah. and I talk to them and she says that's fine as long as they said accept a sandwich. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Oh. So is that what, as long as the doctor accept what Medicare will pay, is that yeah, what that is? Yeah, absolutely. As long as the doctor is a Medicare.
care accepting doctor, they will do it. But the one thing that we find through doing almost 50 of these forms is that often, not often, but at times, someone will call for their wellness visit and they'll go in for the wellness visit and then um, during the wellness visit, the doctor um, may say, well, hey, you know, based upon our conversation, I think you should have this test. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that test will, that, that test gets, you know, it's not, you know, in that um, envelope of being free. So, you know, there may be diagnostic tests that, um, you know, come about because of that wellness visit. He said I'd be fine as long as he says he accepts. And, and I agree with that statement, but I just want to be clear that if it, if it gets into a situation where they start doing other diagnostics, that it would go beyond that. But absolutely, if they accept the assignment, um, and you do it annually, and you're within that, you know, four months, it should. Okay, thank you. People haven't had a chance to talk first, yes, and then over there. Yes. That's not true. You go to the doctor, you wait for three months for your things to come back, they got to send it to the insurance company, you get back a slip that says, Medicare didn't allow it, so neither does the insurance, and you pay the bill. Well, no, and, and what the lady's saying is, you know, at, at times, very often. Does Medicare pay for diagnosis? No. Right? As far as anything, does it pay for diagnosis? Diagnosis? First of all, the doctor has to establish that you have diabetes before they'll pay for diabetes. Run the test, but you have to prove that you have diabetes before they have it. No. My daughter had a surgery for mm -hmm. a gallbladder. Emergency. She's a kid that never goes to a hospital. Okay. Nothing is covered by insurance. Insurance just takes your money and puts it into their funds and pays benefits to people that, sh that buy stock. That's what insurance is doing. If ARP wants to fight, they should be fighting what's happening to these premiums. Because the insurance companies are making money off of it. Plenty of money. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with that. I mean, the, the thing I'm having a hard time figuring out is it would depend on specifically what diagnosis. Um, and you're saying your daughter. I'm had saying that no matter what, with the insurance companies, the insurance company and Medicare work together. If Medicare doesn't allow it, the insurance don't cover it, and you pay it. Right. Young people are being self-insured. They put their self-insuring accounts. They have no faith in their Medicare whatsoever. I have grandchildren that tell me, forget it, Grandma. I'll just put my money away out of my paycheck, and I'll pay my own bills. Mm -hmm. And that's, they're more than we. I mean, there's more young people than old now that are in the workforce. And that's where your money's going. Mm -hmm. But no, I just went to the eye doctor and said I had, they said I have to have cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. They told me I have to have it within three months or, or all this diagnostic testing will not be any good. Mm -hmm. And I have to pay it out of my own pocket if I don't make up my mind within three months and have it done. And they also tell me they're just going to put up. They're going to put a lens in there, take the lens out, put a lens in there, give me a pair of glasses, because if they put an extra lens in, Medicare don't pay. I have to go to Dr. Larson, I have to pay $2,000 for each eye to get so a lens so I can see. Just to summarize. I'm going to see just in front of me now, because that's caused cosmetic. Mm -hmm. This is what I've been told. Mm -hmm. To summarize, basically, why doesn't Medicare uh, provide funding for more service that you're suggesting today. Is that pretty much? Dentures. Mm -hmm. You have to have dental insurance. <laughs> That's a laugh at this stage. There are definitely, I mean, in the best of all worlds, ideally, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, um, but right now there are not enough people uh, in Congress who would support um, it being on, under one system and really dealing with more than just, certain, like, in other words, you talked about dental, you talked about eye, those are the two essentials to be in the I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. Actually, colorectal that you got here, and all these others preventive that you're telling people to have. By the time you get to be 70 years old, I'm sorry, your life is just about over. 
Call to yours up in the morning and say thank you. Thank you, you're alive. Carol, let me, let me just, the person behind, you well, give a quick comment because I want to know the yeah, person I behind you. She, she, uh, younger people normally are not on Medicare. I am 70, I am not young. No, you're talking about your granddaughter. I'm talking about everybody. Yeah, but that is an Medicaid. That's a stuff. different program. Medicaid it's not and Medicaid. I'm not talking about Medicaid. My Here. daughter paid her own bill, $20,000 out of her savings account. I'm saying that our government should be looking into what insurance companies are doing with the money. Not what Medicare is doing. Well, and I'm not looking to the insurance companies who's taking your premium and investing in the stock market and this company, that company, and that company are making money. And it's a fact. Well, you know, I, I think. We're the wrong people to say this because we agree with you. We're not ARP. We're Wisconsin Lodge for Americans. But well, let, let, let no. Let's. The lady back there had, was patiently. You're back there. You had a question or a comment. Preventive care with shingles shot. You know what? Uh, it, it is, uh, the question is, yes. is the shingles vaccination covered under preventive services, under immunizations? And unfortunately, it's not. That's a, that's a question that's come up, and it's, you know, $200, $300, $400. And the reason why is when they developed the preventive services um, component of the Affordable Care Act, they um, took it out of the hands of any elected <laughs> officials, any politicians. They, for, they got the, the, um, a doctor's group and a doctor's panel to put it together. And what they did is... They um, started with the initial preventive services that they felt um, you know, were, were best to start with. And that's not to say that the shingles vaccine is not an important vaccine or is important to anybody. My father had shingles and was in the ER for um, 12 days because of it, so I, I, I get that. But I think what they wanted to do is start with initial preventive services, and there may be a possibility of that in the future, but unfortunately now it's, it's, it's not. So one more question who hasn't had a chance to talk. Yes. Uh, if a person has Medicare supplement insurance, uh, most of these policies also carry a preventative clause in there. Uh, some are $150, some are $300. They will pay for shingles. Just end on this. Uh, your frustration, we're on the same page. you got to believe me. In the best of all worlds, you have a right to certain things, and when and when your daughter is paying X dollars out for insurance, that's, why that's the, wrong. That's why the young go, go along with you. I'm sorry. Okay, one more quick comment. Go ahead. Just one comment. Uh, you may have noticed in the papers that uh, the state insurance commissioner requested a waiver on the 80% premiums to health care uh, request to civilians. If you want to get health care Start voting rights, for God's sake. He said that. We're going to stay out of that conversation. Thank you so much. There's still some coffee left, and I hope this was helpful to you today. Thank you so much. Wonderful.